and we are glad that you are joining us in worship on this Sabbath day. This is a great day to be in the Lord's house as God has allowed us to see again another Mother's Day, but another Sabbath day on this second Sunday in May. In Eastertide, we are grateful that you've joined us. And in so doing, we are grateful today to acknowledge uh, Brother Tyler Smith, who we offering music as our artist and song, and also we're grateful to welcome Reverend Veronica Cannon. Now, she's no stranger to the C. N. Jenkins Church family. Reverend Cannon has served the Presbytery of Charlotte faithfully and currently serves as the moderator of our Presbytery. She's been on the board of Montreat Retreat Association and has done great work with Metropolitan AIDS Agency here in Charlotte. Reverend Cannon, today's her birthday, and so we want to wish a maybe shout out to her on her birthday and happy Mother's Day to her. And it's with joy that I introduce and welcome her to this pulpit. She also serves as my spouse of 32 years plus, and so we are indeed grateful that God has blessed her to accept and receive her call into ministry. We want to say a welcome again to all those who are joining us for the first time by way of video. And we know that God has a word for you. And we simply ask that you get ready, get ready, get ready to be blessed on this holy day. Many ministries are happening in the life of our church, even in the stay-at-home order that we live under. But there is a way for you to share in ministry. We're going to share a video with you now, uh, an invitation of how you can be a part of our mission for the month of May. So if you can, uh, pay attention to the video and also a shout out to Mothers on Mother's Day. All of you, we're grateful. We praise God for you. We're thankful that you are part of this community of faith. So watch this video now, if you will, and you can hear how you can be involved in the ministry and the work of C.N. Jenkins. It's coming for you right now. We praise God.
Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are and what you continue to do in our lives. We ask now that you will join our hearts and our minds together that as we prepare to hear your word proclaimed, that we might see you and hear you in new and refreshing ways. We ask, oh God, that you will help us to let go of all things that keep us from seeing and hearing you that we will open ourselves to your Holy Spirit and that we will become the people of God, that we will have a believer's life doing those things that you have called us to do and to be the people that you have called us to be. And now, oh God, I ask that you will hide me behind the cross that I am not seen or heard, but that you will use me as your vessel to deliver a message to these, your people. May your word become my word, your spirit, my spirit, your heart, my heart. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Please hear these words of scripture from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day as they spent time together to, in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God and having the goodwill of all the people and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My Christian friends, I want to first of all give praise and honor to God to be here with you this morning. But I also want to thank Reverend Jerry Cannon for inviting me to be here this morning to to share in worship and to deliver, this, to deliver this message to you this morning. The passage of scripture that we've read for our hearing is one that may not be as familiar to us, but the passage that, the passage that comes directly before this is. It is about Pentecost and the disciples were in the upper room, as you, may have, as, you, as you may remember, in the upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And there, when the Holy Spirit came, there were people in Jerusalem traveling all through the city, all around the city. And they heard this great noise coming from this upper room, and so they gathered there. And they began to wonder what this was. And then they heard these 12 men begin to speak in native tongues to the places from which they had come. And they began to wonder, who are these men? Aren't they Galileans? Aren't they unschooled? How is it that we are hearing them in our native language? How are we hearing them speak in our native tongue? And many who were there began to say, oh, it must be that they are filled with much wine. And it was at that moment that Peter stood before the crowd and delivered his first sermon to the masses. And in that message, he told them about Jesus Christ and his saving grace and how he had died and was resurrected and had come to save the likes of them. He told them and he warned them and he implored them to get their lives together, to repent and be baptized. And scripture says that 3,000 joined the movement that day. Usually this is where pastors stop with that scripture and they preach about Pentecost. 
But I want us to move into the passage of scripture for our reading this morning, <clears throat> where Jesus and the disciples are giving instruction for us on how to live a believer's life. How to live a life of a believer. Now, this was a time when Peter gave birth to the church. God enabled Peter through his sermon to reach many people. And he gave birth to the church. Now, I am a mother. And I am blessed to have given birth to four wonderful children. And I still remember each one of my children's births. I remember what it felt like when they put that baby in my arms for the first time. And I looked into their tiny little faces and counted each finger and counted each toe. And I remember how amazing it felt and how awestruck I was to know that this child that was in my arms was just a few moments ago inside my body growing and thriving. And then I began to wonder after each moment like that, what kind of mother I would be to that child. What would it take to be a good mother? Because you know that being a biological mother to a child doesn't make you a mother. Mothers come in many colors and many flavors. Mothers are those who give birth. You see, I gave birth to four children biologically, but I also have given birth to two nieces who are now under my care. I have friends who have never given birth to children biologically, but they have mothered hundreds of children over the years as a teacher, nurturing them in education and, and, and coming to see to their basic needs. Some women have, been, have given birth to businesses and ministries that require the, the nurturing touch of a mother. So yes, men and women can be mothers as well. Doctors give birth to medical practice. Lawyers give birth to law firms. Pastors give birth to churches and new ministries. Even you give birth to ministry. Musicians give birth to new music, to new lyrics. Mothers give birth to something <clears throat> that we are in charge of and responsible, and therefore, we want to see it grow and thrive. And Peter gave birth to the church, and 3,000 were added to their number, but that's not the end of the story. Scripture tells us that in order for the church to grow and thrive, that the people had to be devoted. They had to be committed. They had to be dedicated to this new and exciting movement. It took devotion, steadfast faithfulness to the apostles and to one another for the early church to thrive. In fact, Scripture shines light on four things the believer's life should entail if the church is to grow and thrive and, 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 and grow in faith together. They had to, number one, commit to the teaching of the apostles. Two, they had to commit to fellowship with one another. Third, they had to commit to the breaking of bread. And finally, they had to commit to prayer. Whatever we want to see flourish, my Christian friends, it takes commitment. It's not something we can do half-heartedly. We have to put in all of our effort, all of our time, and all of our energy. And I am sure that you have heard your pastor say many times when talking about children that they spelled love, T-I-M-E. And whatever you put your time and effort into is going to take some nurturing. It's going to take that time to put in, to make, sure to make sure things grow and thrive, and it can be all that it can be. When you, give some, when you give your time to something of import, it takes time and it takes nurture. The apostle gave themselves to the people, teaching them all they'd been taught by Jesus. All of the communities they developed beyond Pentecost, to all the churches they started, they taught what they learned from Jesus, and the people received it with joy. They, too, were committed to the teaching that they were given. 
you who are recipients of this word, this teaching, you too have a responsibility to pass on what you have learned so that others might come into this faith and enjoy the same grace, the same love, and the same mercy that you and I enjoy. We have been given a great gift of apostolic faith passed down from the apostles. And we have a responsibility to pass what we learn to others who come into our midst. We have to be committed to teaching just as much as those we teach are committed to learning. We have to be willing to preach and teach Christ crucified, Christ risen. We have to give help to, the, to those who need help. We have to be willing to preach and teach to those who are hopeless, to the unrepentant, to the unsaved. This is part of the believer's life to commit to the teachings of Christ. But it is also part of the believer's life to commit to fellowship. As new converts to the faith, as new converts to the faith come into our midst, we must be prepared to nurture those relationships by providing help, hope, and a haven for all who need it. Not just some, not just those who look like us or who act like us or speak like us, but to all who come and need it. When Peter preached to the Jews in Jerusalem and they went, they went from 150 to 3,000, the apostles committed to fellowship with all of those people. Not just one or two, but to all of them. They were doing a new thing under a familiar faith. Scripture tells us they continued to go to the temple daily for worship. Don't forget, they were Jews, and they only knew going to temple for worship, so they continued to do that daily. They were all together and served a common purpose, however. They experienced a radical economic shift in how they lived together. People sold their possessions and gave what they had to the common good of all. This was new, but they were still Jews. And let me make this clear. They were Jewish. They still worshiped together in the temples. They still heard the scripture read and proclaimed to them. They still worshiped as they always did, but they did what they knew because it was familiar to them. Yet there was a new thing happening in their lives. They were learning a new word preached about the Messiah come to save by the shedding of his blood for the sins of all people. This Jesus was the one who was sent by God to reveal God to the Jews, to fulfill the scriptures that foretold of his coming. He was the long-awaited Messiah, and he left them instruction on how they and therefore how we are to live. It was new. Sell what you have. Give to all who have needs. Spend time with each other, eating your meals together and praying together. They were doing a new thing under an old umbrella. I can't help but think about us today. COVID-19 has changed things for us, my Christian friends. We are living in a new normal, and we must be prepared for a new and radical transformation. Fellowship with God and God's people should be radically different now. We must be prepared to do a new thing under an old umbrella. But how does fellowship look differently when we continue to see things that they have always been? When will change happen? How can we embrace the fellowship of people who can, who can, how can we show hospitality to people who do not have good intentions? How can we invite them into our midst and still be people of God? Many of us have heard the story of Ahmaud Arbery, how he was hunted down and murdered by two men, a father and a son duo, who said that they were defending their neighborhood. They thought that he was the thief because he matched that thief, uh, that, they, that he matched the description of that thief, black while jogging. 
How can we embrace fellowship with people who hold thoughts like that and act like that in our midst, who hunt us down, who want to kill us? How can we be these, how can we accept people into our midst and meet their need? Pastor, how can we embrace and fellowship with people who continue to shame us, to beat us, to accost us, and to discount us as people of God? How can we be around people who see us as less than we are? How do we embrace people like that in fellowship? And I could give you pat answers like, love one another as Christ has loved you. It's true, we should do that, but that doesn't help when we see black bodies falling at the hands of hateful people. I could say, as Colossians 3 verse 13 says, bear with one another, and if anyone has complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive, which is true, but that doesn't heal the heart or calm the spirit of people who see their sons and their daughters and their fathers and their uncles being killed in the streets for no reason at all. But I will tell you, my Christian friends, I can embrace this new normal that we're living in, whatever it may be because of 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I can stand in the midst of people who hate me or may not like me because I do not fear any man. I have power that comes from on high and doesn't come from any man or woman. I have been given a sound mind and so have you, which also means I ain't nobody's fool. So I can love you as Christ commands because he loved people who hated him. I can forgive people who cause me harm or pain because Christ also forgives sinners, including me. But I can also show a sense of hospitality or openness to one who persecutes because I am not foolish. I love and forgive, but I also call on the power of God to give me strength and to rely on that sound mind that God has given to me, to allow me to not be hoodwinked or let someone pull the wool over my eyes. We are not to fear God. We are not to fear any man, but we are to fear God. Do not become complicit in explicit or implicit sin, my Christian friends. God calls us to something greater. We don't have to put our heads in the sand, but God does call us to keep our eyes open and see who's all around us. But God also calls us to be in fellowship with all of God's people, to make space for even those who may cause us harm. We do not yet know what things will be like in the future, but we do know that they will never be fully what they were, nor should they be. Right now, we fellowship together while apart. You who are watching this service today are watching from the comfort of your homes, and yet we are bonded together under one common purpose, one faith, one fellowship. See, yes, yes. Jenkins, you are bound together in fellowship in so many ways. Every morning, your pastors lead a devotion for any and all who want to hear the word of God and pray. Every Tuesday night, Pastor Lansden does a Bible study, the war room, to connect people with the word of God. Every Wednesday afternoon, even now, Pastor Jerry leads a Bible study on Zoom for all who want to study the word. Every Sunday morning, CN Jenkins comes to you live so you can worship together as a community of faith. I know for certain that some pastors are seeking ways to keep you connected as you are separated one from another. They are planning ways to keep the needs of this fellowship before them. They are planning ways for many of you who are, they are planning ways to keep you connected. And many of you are doing ministry right now to help the needs, to fellowship with people, to meet the needs of people who cannot come here to worship in this building. 
You're delivering meals. You're calling one another. You're reaching out over social media. You're praying for workers on the front lines of this epidemic. You're supporting new ministries and are giving birth to them. Fellowship is already, even now, taking place among you. And you may not be aware of just how blessed you really are, Senior Jenkins. Many churches are connecting their congregations one to another in worship, but there are still so many churches that have not had worship in their communities. No connections made, no time to share in God's joy and peace, no time to hear from one another and share in ministry since this pandemic started. You are blessed to have the spiritual leadership and guidance that you have here. And when the time does come, when you are able to return to worship in this building, in this space, do not lose sight of the fact that you are the church where you are right now. And when you return, be prepared to do a new thing under an old umbrella. Because things will not be the same, and they should not be. Your fellowship should feel different. Your fellowship should look different. And you should respond differently to what God is doing in your life and what God will do through you. You have an opportunity to be more than you are right now, to do more than you're doing right now, to reach more people for Christ than you are right now. Your fellowship ought to be more robust, more appreciative of life, more giving, more close-knit, more open. The believer's life is one of devotion to teaching, yes. It's one uh, devoted to fellowship, but it's also the one that's devoted to the breaking of bread. And on this point, I will be brief. The new church that Peter birthed broke bread every day. Yes, they had communal meals together. They opened their homes and they invited people in to eat at their tables. But they celebrated the Lord's Supper every day. They had communion of what, may, what some may call the Eucharist. They did this every day because it was what Christ commanded. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember, saints. What I have done on your behalf, I shed my blood for you. I gave my body as a living sacrifice for you. I died so that you could have life abundantly and eternally with the Father. I took your sins upon myself so that you could commune with God. I did this for you. Every time you drink from the cup, remember my blood shed for your salvation. Every time you eat this bread, remember my body broken for you. Remember all I have done for you until I return in glory. I have said to so many people who have suffered the loss of life of a loved one, be it a parent, a child, a sibling, an aunt or an uncle, a friend, a foe, or a beloved pet, to not focus on the death of the one who died, but to remember the life that that one led. Remember the laughter you shared, the love you spent with each other. Remember the smiles on their faces, the way they made you feel when they entered in the room. Remember the conversations you had and, and that held great meaning or simply made you laugh. Miss them, grieve them, but remember their life. That is what keeps them alive in our hearts. When we focus on their glory moment, the moment of their death, we are filled with great sadness. But a reflection on their lives fills us with joy and honors who they were. I believe this with all my heart as I experienced the loss of both of my parents and most recently my fur baby. I do not honor their lives if I focus on their deaths. When my father passed away over 30 years ago, and I still miss him dearly today, but when he passed away over 30 years ago, I grieved heavily for my father for two years. I cried every single day. One morning when I woke up, I was crying as usual, and I heard God speak clearly to me saying, Veronica, this is not what your father would want for you. You are focusing on his death, and you are not remembering the long life that he had with you. You are not remembering the joy and the laughter and the, and, the, and, the, and the great time that you spent with him. This is not what your father would want for you. This is not what I want for you. That changed my life because I then began to focus on my father's life. 
But it's different with Jesus. Jesus said, I want you to remember my death. When we remember how blessed we are because of that, we remember that God came to save our lives so that we, as sinners, as sinful as we are, could have a relationship with our Creator. Jesus made it possible for us to live an abundant life, filled with second chances, filled with grace, filled with mercy that could have, that could, that could have been ours only in that way. There's no other way we could have been in relationship with our Creator. Celebrating the Lord's Supper helps us remember what Jesus gave up on our behalf. The more we celebrate communion, the more we remember our Lord and what he did for us. This is a great part of the believer's life. We commit to the teachings of Christ. We commit to the fellowship. And we commit to the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper. But the believer also commits to a life of prayer. Prayer is simply communication with God. It's how we make our requests known before God. It is how we express our innermost hopes and desires for others and for ourselves. And it's through prayer that we hear from God when we lift our voices heavenward. Prayer is the center of worship, my Christian friends. A church that prays is in direct communication with our Creator. A preacher who prays for her congregation and for life together opens up possibilities and avenues for God to speak. Prayer provides opportunity for God to show up and show out, to heal the sick, to make whole the brokenhearted, to share in every sorrow and rejoice in every joy. Prayer keeps hope alive in the hopeless and prayer changes course for those who are led astray. Prayer changes things, my Christian friends. The believer's life should be filled with daily, continuous prayer. Every move we make should be a prayer. Every thought we think should be a prayer. Every sight we see should invoke a prayer. Every prayer should bring about some kind of transformation. Someone once told me they appreciated that I prayed before my sermons and that I prayed for people during worship and even prayed privately for people when they brought concerns to me because they knew a preacher who never prayed, never. Not during worship, not for others, not before or after sermons, not for his congregation, never prayed for direction, and I could not believe what I heard because prayer is central to the life of believers and for one who leads is even essential. It is lifted in the Bibles many times that we should pray. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would often go off by himself to pray. He prayed for people. He prayed for himself. He prayed for guidance. He prayed for the people. He prayed for the hopeless. Jesus prayed and he taught his disciples to pray. Prayer exposes us to the awe and wonder of God. I'm going to close with this story. My husband and I traveled to see the Grand Canyon. And when we got there, there was a sign and we got out of the car and we took a picture. And we drove and we saw cars pulled over to the side. So we got out and walked over and we saw this beautiful, beautiful sight. It was gorgeous. The most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. <clears throat> but someone told us, this isn't the Grand Canyon. And I looked at my husband and I said, this isn't the Grand Canyon. He said, apparently not. So we got back in the car and we drove a little further. And when we got to the Grand Canyon, we still couldn't see it right away. You had to walk a bit of a distance. But when you got to the Grand Canyon and you saw what God did through nature, when you see the awesome expanse of the Grand Canyon, when you see the various colors of the rock, it looks as though God himself stepped down and put his footprint 
in that canyon. And it's so beautiful. It brings tears to your eyes and you can't help but praise God for what God has done in that place. My Christian friends, prayer should be that same way. Prayer should be an opportunity for you to see the awesomeness of God. When you pray and God answers your prayer, you should see how God moves and touches the lives of people around you. You should see God move hatred out of the hearts of people who harbor hate. You should see God do a miraculous thing for people who are sick on their sick beds and bring them back to a place of health. We should see stuff happen. We should see transformation happen when we fall on our knees and give God praise for who God is and what God is able to do. You, your life as a believer, should leave impressions on others through your teaching of the gospel. Your life as a believer should open avenues for fellowship, seeking one purpose, one faith, one word, and welcoming all who have need. Your life as a believer should be one of breaking bread. Yes, communal meals, but also remembering the Lord's Supper and remembering Jesus on that Sabbath meal. And your life as a believer should be one filled with prayer. Pray without ceasing. Never give up. Pray out loud. Pray silently. Pray with words and pray heart prayers where no words can be formed, but pray. Give birth today to a believer who does not yet believe. Open their eyes to this glorious life to experience Christ, to experience the church, to experience you, and to lead spirit-filled lives that make a difference. And then watch and see what new thing God does in you and through you, the life of a believer. And let the church say, amen. shut in. Remember those that God calls you to be a part of. Thank you so much for joining C.N. Jenkins Memorial Presbyterian Church. Continue to go to our website, www.cnjenkins.org. Continue to join us for Bible study, fellowship, and thank you so much to our musicians, our technicians, our stage manager, for all of those who continue to make this a great day of worship. May God bless you. May God love you. Happy Mother's Day to all. We preach in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful day.